insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 109 insecurities. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my inspiring and wonderful co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing all right. How about you? I'm doing okay. How was your uh, week so far? It's been going all right. Um, Kind of started off Tuesday with pretty much a quiz in every subject, but um, things have been kind of um, calming down so far, so that's good. Well, at least we can start a week off like that. It can't help but get better, right? Yeah. So that's one thing. You did do something interesting uh, last night, though. What would you do? Tell us about that. Uh, um, I actually went to the first rehearsals for uh, marching band. And how'd that go? It went well. Uh, We kind of did some visuals on how and commands on kind of like what Um, They talk about when they're marching and playing, um, and then we got to play some of the music that I had played with my my band teacher, um, and then we kind of just closed everything out. Cool. So is it something you think you're going to stick with for a little while? For now, at least. I'll kind of see how the rest of it goes and, you know. Okay. But that's not what we're talking about this week. This week, we're talking about insecurities. What does it mean to be insecure? What type of insecurities are there? What are the signs of insecurity? We'll discuss all this and we'll take a look at how to deal with insecurity in this week's episode of Insights into Teens. But before we do that, though, I would uh, invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. If you want the video versions of all of our show's podcasts, you can subscribe to Insights into Things. If you just want the audio versions of this podcast, you you can subscribe to Insights into Teens. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, and any place else you can get a podcast these days. Uh, We would also invite folks to give us some feedback. Write in, give us some show suggestions, tell us how we're doing. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can give us feedback on Facebook at facebook.com slash insightsintothingspodcast. Or on Instagram at Instagram.com slash Insights Into Things. Or right through our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Are we ready to get started? Why not? All right. So the first thing we should do, I guess, is what we normally do. And that's define what we're talking about here. And today's definition uh, was found by you. You did the research for today's topic and you used WebMD for this one. So why don't you tell us what does insecurity mean? Insecurity is a feeling of inadequacy or not being good enough and uncertainty. It produces anxiety about your goals, relationships, and ability to, ha- to handle certain situations. Everybody deals with insecurity from time to time. It can appear in all areas of life and come from a variety of causes. It might stem from a traumatic event, patterns in previous experiences, social conducting, or learning learning roles by observing others, or local environments. So with that in mind, and before we get into any more of the specifics, do you think you have any insecurities? Um... I definitely think I have a few insecurities. Um, would you like me to specify or? Well, only if you're comfortable talking about it. I mean, I have um, some pretty broad insecurities, like um, 
do I actually think I'm good enough to be in all of the advanced classes or the academies or stuff like that relating to my academics? That makes sense. And, you know, I, I'll be honest, I have my own insecurities. Um, a lot of it has to do with body image. Obviously, I'm a, I'm a big guy. I have been my whole life. So there's, there's social insecurities with that. Um, probably my biggest insecurity is actually being in a crowd and having a conversation in a crowded room. Mm. Um, and the reason for that is I have issues with hearing. So when I'm in a crowded room and there's a lot of voices going on, it's very difficult for me to distinguish one voice from another. So if you and I happen to be at a restaurant and the restaurant happened to be loud and you were talking to me, I'd have a very difficult time understanding what you were saying because it sort of blends into the, to the background noise with my hearing issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so it makes me very insecure to be in uh, a social environment like that. So we all have, everyone has insecurities of some form or another. I think the biggest thing is identifying them and addressing them more than anything else. But there are specific types of insecurities. Why don't you tell us about what the specific types of insecurity are? So the first type of insecurity that we have is called relationship insecurity. One of the most common kinds of insecurity concerns relationships or attachments. Attachment theory originated out of the desire to connect the attachment patterns of early childhood to later relationship patterns and reliability available and supportive. The child often feels insecure for forms of negative self-image and relationship models and experiences greater emotional distress later in life. Relationship or attachment issues don't need to begin in early childhood. They can arise wherever previous experience of per or personal identity undermines someone's security in their closest relationships. So now, do you think you <clears throat> suffer from, based on that definition, relationship insecurity? I mean, I'm pretty sure people have always kind of, like, I'm pretty sure plenty of people have had that instance where, like, you message with your one friend, you text your friend something, and they don't respond in a few hours, and you're kind of wondering, well, do they not like me anymore? Is something going on? Like, yeah. I sometimes have that insecurity about <coughs> some of my friends. Um, uh, I, um, I also don't know if this pertains to, like, actual romantic relationships i'm guessing it does sure why wouldn't it um um i definitely had my fair share of being insecure about well people my age are already kind of figuring out who they like and are even dating people and i'm here still not sure who or what i'm interested in uh and i really don't know um, what to make of it. I've gotten a bit better in, abs in accepting the fact that it's fine to not know yet, but there's still always something like that in the back of my mind that, well, this person my age already has this figured out. So, yeah, I'd say I have a bit of it. You know, <clears throat> I'll, I'll give you a little bit of insider information. Nobody at the age of 14 has anything figured out. <laughs> It takes you, you know, I'm much older than that, and I still don't have everything figured out. <laughs> so don't ever think that that's, that's a factor there. Um, but at age 14, I don't think you have anything to worry about. I had relationship insecurity. Um, most of the relationships I've ever been in, I've had relationship insecurity. But it didn't stem from my partner so much as it stemmed from my own sense of self-worth. And a lot of that stems back to the the body image issues I've had and the insecurities I've had about that. Like, you know, why would this person want to be with me, you know, when I look the way that I do type thing? And, you know, sometimes that's been an issue in relationships that I've had in the past. I'm very fortunate now that, that you know, mommy sees beyond the surface, you know, the skin deep type thing. Uh, and, and mommy sees, you know, the person that's inside and no, I didn't need someone. 
Um, <laughs> but you know, they they tell you, you know, there's there's this that phrase that people say all the time that you can't judge a book by its cover. And and that's true. I mean, the person that you are, you could be an incredibly attractive, beautiful person on the outside, but you could be rotten to the core on the inside, the way that you treat other people, and you could be selfish. Um, or you could look like an ogre like me and be a pretty decent person on the inside. Uh, it just, you know, it, it took finding mommy to, to see that person on the inside myself because I didn't see that person for a long time. Mm. So a lot of times the people that you're around can help you with your insecurities. What's the next type of insecurity we have? So the next one probably doesn't apply to many teens, but it can kind of be interpreted in different ways, I suppose. This one is job insecurity. Job insecurity occurs when you are anxious about your continued employment or about the continuation of certain benefits attached to your employment. It can be triggered by anxiety over your own job performance or anxiety over factors beyond your control, such as the economy, industry trends, workplace conflict, or the danger of company restricting, restructing, restructuring, restructuring or failure. High rates of unemployment and temporary work increase job insecurity on, nat on a nat national scale and contribute to widespread mental health problems. Yeah, and this is a big factor now because of the way um, the pandemic has affected <clears throat> so many businesses. You've had so many businesses, especially in the service industry, like bars and restaurants that have had to shut down. And as a result, you have massive unemployment. I mean, you've got unemployment numbers that have been approaching Great Depression level unemployment. Um, and it's no fault of the employees. You know, it's not like you're not doing your job, but if the company itself can't continue to work, it's going to be a problem. Uh, Mommy and I have been very fortunate that our companies have not been as affected by the pandemic and we've been able to continue working. Mommy's work um, her company has allowed her to work remotely. I've been going into the office. But um, there's always some level of insecurity there, especially when you have a family to take care of. You know, if, if, if I didn't have my job, the biggest concerns that I have are making sure that, you know, we've got a house, we've got a roof over our head, we've got food on the table. You start to think of those very basic types of elements in environments like this where the luxuries and the nice to has become less important and you start to appreciate the fact that I can pay the mortgage at the end of the month or I can go grocery shopping and I can make sure we have food. Um, so the, it's a significant driver of anxiety when you have job insecurity, especially in times like now. Yeah, and I can actually kind of see an indirect relation to it with teens. Like, like, there was a point um, on Monday when you went in where Mommy had mentioned that you might be losing your job. You say you're coming around to the point where you might have to look for another job because you might end up quitting or they might end up firing you. Right. And I can definitely see teens in similar situations like that worrying about these larger issues. Of course, they're probably not worrying about whether they're going to work the ne go to the work the next day or if they um, need to leave work, but more or less the effects of one of their parents or relatives ha or guardians leaving work and how it will affect their lifestyle in a way. Absolutely. I remember as a kid, <clears throat> my father had retired from one job and he started working another job because we just didn't have the income to not have him work. And they wound up letting him go at the job. And there was a significant amount of worry about whether or not we were going to continue to be able to live where we were. Were we going to have to move in with other family until we got back on our feet and and a lot of that stuff, it's, it's very scary for kids. For me at that point, it was like, okay, well, if, if we can't afford to keep the house because we were renting at the time, then we're going to move in with grandma and grandpa. Well, they live in a completely different town, which means I have to go to a different school now and I have to go through all that process. And you experience anxiety and stress, but it's different than the anxiety and stress that the adults are experiencing, but it's no less real 
for you as a teenager either because it does have a direct impact on you. Yeah. So that's that's important to keep in, a, in mind. What's our next type of insecurity? The next type of insecurity is one you've already mentioned. Body image insecurity. A common source of insecurity is body image. Many people feel insecure about the way they look and question whether they measure up to an imposed ideal. There is no necessary connection between actual body body health or appearance and body insecurity. People of all body types can experience this type of insecurity. I like to think I've kind of grown past my insecurities here. It's been to the it's to the point now where I'm kind of set in my ways. So as long as I'm healthy, I think I'm happy. I don't think I have some unrealistic unrealistic expectation that I'm going to be 230 pounds and slim and and athletic at any point in time in my life. Um, and there comes a point when People make fun of you long enough because of the way you look that it just stops bothering you at some point. And, and I came to that realization probably 10 years ago. You know, there wasn't any specific, uh, incident where it happened, but it was just like, yeah, I'm fat. I, I get it. Thanks for pointing it out. You know, if things don't work out with your current job, you can be a, a detective for figuring that one out. And you just move on. Um, but for teens, it can be overwhelming, I have to imagine. Well, it was for me when I was a teen because everyone looked at you because of the way that you looked. And they still do. You know, teens can be very mean when it comes to your appearance. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any, have you had any experience with with body shaming or insecurities around, you know, the way you look, the way you dress? your hair, anything like that? I mean, I don't think I've directly experienced people saying that I, well, shaming me for how I look, but I can definitely say that there are instances where I kind of look in the mirror and I think, well, you know, maybe if things looked a little differently, I'd be a little more, a little bit better. Of course, um, being a teen, some of this stuff's normal, like... Pimples. I really can't um, control that. Right, you that can't much. avoid that. Yeah, um, but pimples have somewhat co- become an insecurity for me. Um, and although I'm more than likely not overweight, um, there are some times where I kind of wish I was a little thinner. Uh, like I have um, a sizable stomach. Um, uh, But, and a lot of times I really don't like admitting it, so I really kind of try hiding it sometimes. One of the main, one of the reasons I actually wear hoodies is, um, because it makes me think I'm a little skinnier, but I don't really, I don't think I have it as bad of an, of a body insecurity as other people do. Like, sometimes I accept the fact that I'm like, okay, I look this way. Oh, well, um, I just try to fix myself up as best I can. Um, but this, I can definitely say the insecurity's there. It's just not as prominent as others probably have it. Yeah. And a lot of times it's self-imposed. It's not necessarily something that society imposes on you. More often than not, we're our own worst critics. Right. You know, we look at ourselves in the mirror every day and we make a judgment call every day. Do I need to brush my hair different? Do I need to uh, wear different clothes? Does this, you know, does this shirt make me, do these pants make me look fat? And my conclusion usually is no, my fat makes me look fat. But (laughs) that's why I stopped worrying about it. You know, there's only so much, (laughs) I only have so much to work with here. So there's only so much I can do. So you kind of have to accept what you've got. And you, and you work with it. You can't beat yourself up about it. Yeah. What's the last insecurity we have? The last insecurity is called social insecurity. Another common type of insecurity surrounds the way that we are perceived by our pe- peers at the ease with which we interact with them. This insecurity can be a reoccurring, low-level problem, or it can blossom into full-blown social anxiety or social phobia. 
Now, this is that's a very good point about the social phobia here is that you have people that they have to interact with people, but they have this crippling fear of doing so. Um, I don't interact with people all that much. Um, I don't like people and it's nothing personal. It's just that I deal with people a lot with my job and all of my patience in dealing with people goes into that. So when I get out of work, I'm really not a particularly social individual. Part of it has to do with the hearing insecurity. Part of it has to do with the body image insecurity. Um, part of it has to do with my interest and the things that I like and can talk about are not anywhere near the same kind of categories that other people that I would interact with. Like I'm not a sports person, you know, I'll watch football or this or that, but I'm not the type of person that can go to a party and, and sit in a room full of guys and talk about football and, and this athlete and the draft and all that stuff. It doesn't work for me. Um, I'm a technology guy. I'm a, I watch documentaries primarily on TV, so I'm pretty boring. So <laughs> it's difficult for pe for me to interact with people like that because not that many people are as boring as I am. Um, and that's the, the honest truth about it. Now, do you, do you experience social insecurities on any level? I mean, in certain ways, yes. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm a full blown introvert or that I have social anxiety, but I definitely experience a lot of things that introverts typically do. Like I don't really go outside that much. Nobody does now. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Before the pandemic, I should say. Okay. Um, before the pandemic, I never really went outside that often. I only really spoke with friends, and I rarely ever made new ones. Um, and for the most part, I kind of kept to myself. Um, I didn't hate interacting with people. Um, uh, I could definitely socialize with people, especially if there was a topic that I could talk about, because... You know how I can monologue, and that kind of yes, gets you can. and that gets conversations going pretty quickly. Um, but I still had issue. But my main issue was starting conversations. I was never really able to make the first move when it came to talking to people, and there were very few instances where I actually was the one that um, spoke first. When meeting my one friend, I did end up speaking first, but when meeting another one of my friends, they ended up speaking first. It was kind of... I know I can talk to people, it's just I don't have much experience with starting the conversations. If they can start up... If they start up the conversations, I'll typically be fine, especially if they do mention a topic that I know and can talk about for hours on end. Um, So, overall... I'm an ambivert. So maybe what you need is you need like a cheat sheet of topics that you walk around with so that you can figure out a topic that you can start a conversation with and that'll get you going. Yeah, that's just the thing. Um, I never entirely know how full on extroverts start conversations. Like, I don't know which conversation would be best for which kind of person and in which kind of instance. And it's kind of like I kind of take it into more of like a strategic level in a way and I kind of wonder how extroverts are able to start conversations pretty easily and it makes me kind of wonder like what goes into it. So maybe then what you need is you need your cheat sheet of topics and a die and you roll the die and whatever number comes up that's the topic you're going with. Maybe. I don't know. Just a thought. <laughs> Anyway, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back and we're going to look at what some of the signs of insecurity are. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, 
and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to Insights in the Teens. Today we're talking about insecurities and what are the signs of insecurities. So the first one we have to talk about here is low or superficial self-esteem. One sign of insecurity is low self-esteem or negative self-image, particularly when that image seems to be inconsistent with external observation. Low self-esteem means you think badly about yourself or your abilities. It can lead to other problems, especially concerning mental health. Because the measurement of self-esteem generally relies on self-report, insecurity can lead to superficial self-esteem. People with insecurities often want to appear secure. Deliberate misrepresentation or false behavior or information on social media can also be a sign of social anxiety. The act of faking then reinforces the social insecurity. So in this case here, I would, I would probably say that I definitely suffer from a certain amount of social uh, insecurity when it comes to the superficial self-esteem because a lot of times you see even what I'm doing here in the podcast here is a little bit of self-deprecating humor to kind of break the ice and, and ease into things you know, while still staying on topic. Do you think that any of your securities have led to or been caused by a low or superficial self-esteem? Probably, yeah. Um, there are certain parts of me where I know that I'm good in certain things, but then there's always that one part of me that's like, well, what if you're not? And that's probably the part of me that causes most of my insecurities. I can also kind of relate to the feeling of wanting to appear secure, like, I don't really, I don't really try and hide my insecurities that often, it's just I really don't talk to people about it that often, and it's not like it's ever really come up in conversations, and even on the podcast, when I have talked about my insecurities, they really haven't gone, I really haven't gone too much in depth. Right. Like, there's a part of me that's like, um... That's like wanting to get it out, but also there's all there's the other part of me that's like they probably don't want to hear about your problem, so you can probably just forget about it. Well, and I think there's another aspect of that where it's the vulnerability of it. You know, talking about your insecurities and the things that bother you requires you to let down your guard and it requires you to make yourself vulnerable. And our human instinct is to sort of put up our, our hands and to defend ourselves when we feel vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that need to drop those defenses in order to talk about it is probably one of the things that's causing some resistance as well. Yeah. The next thing they talk about is perfectionism. The inability to be satisfied with progress and need to control and refine projects until they're perfect can be a sign of insecurity. It stems from the sensation that you or your performance is never enough. It could appear as a manifestation of insecurity in any area of life, but is frequently found in cases of job insecurity and body insecurity. Eating disorders, for example, often appear along with both harmful perfectionism and attachment insecurities. Now, I have to ask... Because I don't think this applies to me because there's nothing that I do that I strive for perfection in. My motto is good enough is good enough. But you, on the other hand, are tend to be a bit of a perfectionist in some of the things that you work on. Do you think that that is an example of insecurity or is that just your ability to excel at the things that you try to do? 
bit of both, I guess. Okay. Um, I definitely always try and succeed whenever I do become a perfectionist. But in some of those instances, um, I have been known to be unsatisfied, even if my work was good enough and satisfactory. And a lot of times I try pushing myself further and sometimes I'm just never satisfied and I'm trying to get better. I have gotten a little better, but still not exactly perfect if you get what I'm saying. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, the the desire to drive yourself to be better isn't a bad thing unless it gets out of control. Yeah. And I think they're talking about here that this is when it gets out of control, where you're trying to control things that you can't control or probably shouldn't control in order to compensate for those insecurities. I don't think that's where you're at, though. I think you you want to succeed because you you like success. And that's probably the best motivator out there. Yeah, but the times when I don't entirely succeed is really when those insecurities kind of set in. Absolutely. You are very rough on yourself when you don't meet your own expectations. Mm -hmm. Self-isolation is the next thing they mention. Social insecurity can lead people to avoid social interactions, isolating themselves. Sometimes these people prefer to interact virtually in internet situations. They feel they can control. Now this one, I'm, I, I raise my hand and, and I plead guilty on this one because I tend to self-isolate largely because of my social insecurities. Uh, and other people have suffered as a result of this. For instance, you know, mommy's much more social than I am. And early on in our relationship, my insecurities and inability to interact functionally in a social environment meant that we didn't do a lot of the things that mommy wanted to do, or she would have to do them on her own and I would stay home. Um, so one of the things you have to watch out for here is the effect that it's having on other people. Do you feel, I mean, you mentioned that you don't go out much or didn't go out much before the pandemic. Do you feel that you're self-isolating as a result of insecurities or is it something else entirely? I mean, I actually don't think I can entirely relate to self-isolation, despite the fact that I never really went out much. I still interacted with friends, especially at school, and there were instances where I would visit my friends on the weekends. Um, so I wouldn't really say that this entirely applies to me. I did do a bit of self-isolation, especially now, but we can't really compare it to that. Um, but I actually don't entirely think this applies to me, um, that all, that much. Okay. Well, that's good. Anxious or avoidant is the next symptom. Attachment insecurities often result in problematic attachment styles or dysfunctional approaches to relationships. The two most common are anxious and avoidant attachments. Anxious attachment styles are characterized by emotional dependence, relying on someone else for your emotional well-being, a fear of being alone, and fantasies of perfect relationship relationships that can never be fulfilled. Avoidant attachment styles also stem from insecurity, but go in the other direction. People with this style tend to keep relationships superficial and disengaged from more intimate connections. I, I, I'm kind of on a fence on this one here. I have a very small group of core friends that I hold close and outside of that group of four or five people, everybody else I refer to as an associate. So I think I'm kind of a mix of both of these. Do you think this applies to you? I mean, I can definitely say that I'm pretty dependent on a lot of on people, especially with you and Mommy, um, since we have been stuck here for a while and the fact that you guys have that we're very close and that you guys probably have more experience than I do. I depend a lot 
on you guys whenever I have my problems. And sometimes I do think and wish that, um, I didn't entirely depend on you so hard because I can't imagine the emotional toll it's actually taking on you guys seeing your child, you know, insecure, worried, and just overall having lots of negative emotions. Yeah. It's really not that big a deal. I kind of expect it, you know, as a, as a parent, that's kind of what we do. You know, we're there to support you. We're, we're there to teach you the right path. We're there to help you get over these, any of these insecurities or issues that you have. Um, the absence of that, I think, makes me feel almost like, a, I don't know, like I'm not a good parent. You know, like if I didn't have that to do, I don't know if I would be able to have that, that feeling of, of, of being an active parent. Um, you know, Sam, for instance, when he was your age and, and growing up, um, we only had him part time on the weekends or every other weekend. So I missed out on a lot of stuff and I missed out a lot on these things and having these talks with him and helping him work through these issues. Usually the time that he was with us, it was his recreational time, his relief time. You know, we'd play video games or go out or something like that. So we never had this kind of interaction with Sam and I didn't realize how much I missed having that until I had the opportunity to, to help you through some of these. That's why I, you know, the whole point of this podcast was, was really to help get you through these so we could have these focus sessions. Um, so it's not a burden, uh, at all on me, uh, nor do I, I don't want to speak for mommy, but I don't suspect it's a burden for mommy either. That's what we do as parents. Um, so that's not something you should ever be concerned about. Yeah, that was also probably one of my other insecurities, feeling like I was a burden on you guys, and I'm pretty sure you are pretty well aware of that at this point. Yeah, we joke around that you're our, our little burden, but <laughs> kids are supposed to be a burden to their parents until they reach a certain age. That's socially acceptable. Um, but that's what being a parent is. It's It's not just hanging out with your kids when it's fun, right? It's it's about getting through those hard times. It's about guiding you and teaching you and and going through those things with you. Because I can tell you one thing, as a man, you I've gone through more things with you than I, I ever would have if I didn't have a daughter. And it's been a learning experience for me, and it's enriched my life going through these things and understanding these things and seeing things from your perspective. Um, so it's been beneficial for me to go through these types of things, and, and I'm grateful that I have a daughter that I can do that with. You know, the fact that you're you're that trusting and you're that open to to talk to us about it, I think, is fantastic. So don't stop that. Okay. Uh, moving right along, we have uh, poor job performance. Uh, job insecurity, not having a stable job, can work to motivate some people, but it more often results in poorer performances. It can lead to you avoiding work, wanting to change jobs after you start at one, disengagement from colleagues, and in-group projects, and work attitudes. Now this one is, it's really not one that's a team related one, but this is one that I can definitely uh, speak to here. Cause I've been in jobs where, you know, I've been underutilized or I've been underappreciated or I've been put in positions where I'm not qualified to be in there, but I've had to do it anyway. And the, the overall lack of confidence, uh, mm -hmm tends to make the job frustrating or scary in some cases, like going to work knowing that, oh my God, the entire company resides on, on me fixing this issue and I don't know how to fix the issue right now. 
And that can be very overwhelming and very anxiety inducing. Mm -hmm. Think of it almost like um, a project at school and you have a team project and you've got a bunch of kids on the project with you and you have to do your part and you just don't understand how to do it or you don't think you don't have the confidence that you've done it yourself. Is that anything you've ever gone through? I mean, I don't think it wasn't. I mean, I have experienced group projects, um, but I've never really been in that situation too much. Like, I've always gotten my work done in the projects, and sometimes, you know, I've been the one person, the only person on the group who's actually done anything about it. Um, but I've never really been in the scenario where, like, every where, like, I had a really major part and I didn't understand it. For the most part, I understood most of the projects, and even if I didn't understand something, I normally would just give it to someone who did. Um, but I can definitely um, picture what that situation would be like. Okay. So the last thing they talk about here is depression or anxiety, which is, you know, they, they, they say the signs of insecurity. Well, depression and anxiety are the signs of so many other things, too. <laughs> so yeah. if, if this is what you're suffering from, it could be one of many things, just, yes. just to be clear. All types of insecurity can lead to decreased mental wellness. Depressive or anxious behavior or thinking is often an effect of insecurity, particularly when in that insecurity produces or is accompanied by wrong beliefs or patterns of thought. Um, have you experienced depression or anxiety that was a related that was related to insecurity at any point? I mean, yeah, I've definitely experienced anxiety, especially when it came to my my academic insecurities. I've never really experienced depressive states that often, um, but anxiety has definitely been something that's come up multiple times, and it is normally a result of mainly my insecurity about my academics, so... And I'm pretty sure it won't stop until, you know, I'm actually out of school. Then it'll probably just be re replaced with job insecurity. You never know. Well, there you go. At least the tradition continues on, right? <laughs> so that was all we had on the signs and symptoms. We're going to take a quick break and come back. And we'll talk about some suggestions on how to deal with insecurities. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. Today, we're getting insecure. Let's talk about some things about how to deal with insecurity. Occasional insecurity is a natural part of life. For deeper and more long-lasting feelings of insecurity, however, professional therapists can help you sort through your emotions and develop strategies of life. Dealing with insecurity, here's a couple of tips. What's our first tip? Our first tip is that social networks matter. Broad and meaningful social networks, friendships, relationships with coworkers, and more help to lessen both insecurity and its negative effects. There's an inverse correlation between healthy social networks and insecure attachment styles. Having a wide cycle of friends and many close connections allows you to develop the tools and confidence to engage in deeper relationships. And I honestly have to say this is probably the one thing that has helped me more than anything else is this is the 
the friendships that I've been able to, to call on, um, especially now. Um, and ironically enough, none of them are my friends because I don't have any friends. Oh. It's They were all mommy's friends. Um, you know, our friends up in, in Bethlehem. Uh, and other other friends and coworkers that mommy associates with that we've been very fortunate to have interactions with uh, have been very helpful in dealing with insecurities for me. How about you? Do you have a core group of friends that you rely on when you know you're feeling insecure or feeling any of those symptoms? Yeah, I have a group of friends that I typically talk with whenever I feel a bit insecure or need someone to talk to. Um, I definitely think um, the kids my age, I can definitely talk with about with more of my insecurities because um, they can more than likely relate to me. With the slightly younger kids, I kind of hang with them. Um, so they kind of give me a bit of entertainment, you know, they kind of de-stress me in a way they don't entirely like I don't entirely tell them all my insecurities there are points where I do tell them but normally they just try and help lighten the mood and I'm thankful for that as well yeah and I think hanging around with the younger kids kind of elevates you to a certain point you're kind of in that role model position and having the younger kids look up to you is a confidence boost that that helps you get over that insecurity a lot of times yeah What's our second one? Our second one is that trust takes practice. While having an overly trusting behavior creates its own problems, ask yourself if you have any reason to distrust expressions of affection or liking from others. People with insecurities sometimes express doubt and can perceive re- rejection in everything from a partner relationship to new acquaintances. These expressions can be self-fulfilling. Practice taking displays of interest at face value, something that can ap- that can be easier in more casual relationships. You can build up the confidence to accept deeper affection and intimacy. So, how easy is it for you to trust? Um, I'd say I'm not 100% untrustworthy. Well, not untrustworthy. I know. Untrusting. I don't think I'm 100% untrusting, but I definitely know that the lesson, don't trust people. Like, I'd like to think that certain people, that people are nice and not entirely bad. Um, And I try not to think badly of people, but there are instances where um, I sometimes trust someone's honesty. See, this is this is one of those situations where I, I think you're wise beyond your age. Um, me personally, I'm not a very trusting individual. In fact, there, I don't trust very many people at all. Um, and the people that I do trust are those people that are in my my core group. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's experience. I've been burned a lot of times. And every time you trust someone and get burned in that trust, it makes you a little bit more gun shy to to give out that trust. And and I've developed the philosophy over time that trust is, and we've talked about this. Trust is like currency. It's very easily, it's very difficult to earn it, but it's very easy to squander it. And if people want me to trust them, they have to earn that trust and. My expectations for people in general, and this is probably a kind of a jaded view, but my expectations for people in general are very low. And unfortunately, they seldom fail to meet those low expectations. Uh, So a lot of people don't give me reason to trust them. Yeah, and I think my reason for not entirely trusting people is, one, the fear of having something bad happen to me, because I know that's happened before, other people have had experience with it, and there are definitely people who I know, I fe- who I feel I can't trust, and the fear of being wronged by people um, is enough to make me more or less cautious of them. 
another reason I'm guessing is kind of the effect you've kind of had on me. Like you said... (laughs) Gee, thanks. Like you said, you're not a very trusting individual, and you always tell me trust no one um, but yourself. And um, in a way, I've kind of kept that. Um, I think that also might be one of the reasons I'm not the most sociable person. Um, But I can say I've... I definitely have more trust in people and more and a bit of higher expectations than you have of people. Um, so you haven't affected me that much. That's good. <laughs> but I definitely am not the most trust. I'm definitely not the most trusting person you'll meet. Well, that's good. I don't. I want you to be wise beyond your ears, but I don't want you to be a miserable old man like me. <laughs> The last thing I did want to talk about, and and we don't actually have it in the notes here. This is kind of an ad lib. And that's courage. You know, having courage to confront your insecurities or anything, your fears, um, the the things that make you cringe, I like to say. Um, Having the courage to confront those is a major tool. And a lot of people tend to shy away from these things. They shy away from the things that make them uncomfortable or the things that take them outside their comfort zone. Um, And the people that confront these things, you know, your body image, your job insecurity, they're the ones that can make a difference about it. If you're afraid of what it is that you're insecure about and you never confront it or you never address it, then you don't have control. It has control of you. And that's even more frightening, I think. When I have an insecurity, you know, if my insecurity is my body image. And I take to heart everything that people say about me. And people make fun of me. And and believe me, people have made fun of me my whole life about it. I've been a big guy since, since I was born. Um, little factoid i was actually the biggest kid in the hospital when i was born um which for some reason my mother was very proud of that fact i'm not really sure why but she spoke of it with a great deal of pride when she told me about it uh so my whole life i've been like that and for a large portion of my life i let people tell me how i felt about myself and i realized later in life that that was a mistake And it wasn't until I took control of that situation and I took control of my own image of what I thought of myself. And I do that with the self-deprecating humor. I'm fat. I get it. I know I am. You know, people, one of the things that kids used to say, you know, oh, oh, you're fat. I said, well, I'm fat. You're ugly. I can die. You know, you know, there's something that I can do about it. And, um, And when I realized that, when I started to take control of those things, it was very liberating. You know, it it allowed me to have control of that portion of my life back. And I think a lot of people experience that when they've got the courage to confront those insecurities. You know, the first thing is you have to acknowledge that you have the insecurity and why you have it. And then once you do that, then you have the, the choice. You can make the act of choice to do something about it. And even just making that choice, even if you're not successful in dealing with it the way that you initially choose, just the choice to do something about it is liberating. And it it's self-motivating. And it gives you a level of confidence knowing that I'm taking control of this aspect of my life that I didn't have control over. Even if I'm not 100% successful, just the fact that I'm doing something about it is very liberating. So is there anything that you've had or in insecurities that you've had in your life that, that you've chosen to confront and to take on rather than to shy away from it? How, if, you, if so, how did that make you feel? Well, probably the biggest one right now would be my academics. Um, I had insecurities about not being able to get good grades, um, whether or not I was good to be whether or not I should have joined marching band, and exactly how high school was going to go. 
but it was one of the ones where I'm like, okay, let's try confronting this. For getting better grades, I made sure that I studied more. I checked my answers, and I made sure that I knew what I was doing. Um, I ended up confronting the whole marching band fear by seeing what it was like and checking it out and seeing if it was something I was going to do. Um, while I haven't been fully successful, I've definitely felt a lot better about my academics and um, confronting them and going to the marching band rehearsal and checking my answers and studying and getting those good grades is very fulfilling and I don't entirely have as large of a um, fear about it. Yeah, that's great. It's very empowering, you know, when you take control of that situation. You might not always win the battle with that insecurity, but at least now you're fighting it on your terms and it's not controlling you. So that was all we had for insecurities. We're going to take a, a very quick break and come back and we're going to get your closing thoughts on the topic. Go for your closing remarks. All right, I just wanted to say to everyone that insecurities are normal. Everyone's going to have them. Everyone more than likely has had them. And you're more than likely um, going to have securities your whole life. But there are ways that you can deal with those insecurities. And they can't. And just know that they, they don't have the ability to empower you, to take control of you, as long as you do something about it. Try some of these tips, and if these tips aren't helpful, try seeking, um, you know, higher, great, I don't know how to say it. <laughs> professional help. Try seeking professional help for it. Um, and just know that, it's all right. Everyone has insecurities and you're not alone. Okay. Sage advice as always. Thank you. Uh, so that was all we had for the show today. I would invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get video versions listed as insights into things. Audio versions of this podcast can be found as insights into teens on Apple podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Amazon, etc., etc. All in one breath too. Nice. I would also invite folks to uh, contact us, email us at comments at insights into things dot com. Get us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can get high res versions of all of our videos on YouTube at youtube dot com slash insights into things. We do stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch dot tv slash insights into things. If you are an Amazon Prime subscriber, you do get a free Twitch Prime subscription. Uh, monthly. Uh, if you threw that our way, we'd appreciate it. Audio versions of this podcast can be found at podcast.insightsintoteens.com. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast on Instagram. We're at instagram.com slash insights into things where you can get links to all that stuff on our website at www.insightsintothings.com and you. And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights into Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights into Tomorrow, our monthly podcast, hosted by you and my brother, Sam. That's it. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.